Good evening. Welcome to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. My name is Kirk Johnson. I'm the Chief Curator and Vice President for Research and uh, Collections here at the museum. And it's my tremendous pleasure to welcome you here to the museum. Um, I'm going to introduce momentarily Patty Limerick, who will introduce two of my favorite people and speak with them. Patty Limerick, as you know, is the, uh, the driving force behind the Center for the American West, and for a number of years now, we've been trying to lure her down from the heights of Boulder down to the plains of Denver to bring that peculiar breed of delightful um, understanding of the American West to Denver. And tonight, she will be having a conversation with uh, one of my favorite guys, Teddy Roosevelt, and he is also another one of my favorite guys. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Patty Limerick. They had the Franklin exhibit here, the wonderful Franklin exhibit. I am not an expert on the 18th century, but because I love the Museum, the Museum of Nature and Science, I actually took weeks out of my life and became an expert on women in 18th century colonial America so I could give a lecture as a part of the series. That is not my area of expertise, ladies and gentlemen, so that is really a measure of my devotion. So I love this museum, and I'm really very happy to be here. I have been a fan of Clay Jenkinson. Um, for years. He is, I used to say that Ken Burns is the person who above all others in the country had brought people's attention to history and engaged them in serious and attentive ways and that's kind of true except that Clay Jenkinson I think outranks Ken Burns and if Ken Burns' feelings are hurt we'll just have to deal with that because Clay Jenkinson certainly has been in contact with people in the most direct and immediate way Obviously, a Ken Burns film changes people's lives. People are impressed by that, but it is really Clay's in-person engagement that has been so extraordinary, awakening people <coughs> to history. Uh, his bio is on your programs, and so I'll refer you to that. Theodore Roosevelt, I will say just a teeny bit about before bringing him up. I'm a Western American historian. As a Western American historian, I run into the impact of Theodore Roosevelt every working day. Whatever you look at in the American West, there are Mr. Roosevelt's fingerprints and Mr. Roosevelt's legacy and impact. So a Western American historian is certain to have moments of thinking, oh, I wish I could ask that fellow a few questions. Well, tonight, what do you know? Tonight I will have that, that chance. So that's quite a dream to come true. I admire um, President Roosevelt in many, many ways. I do find a few of his ideas peculiar and eccentric, and actually maybe quite a few of his ideas peculiar and eccentric, and then I find a few of his ideas disturbing and alarming, but the bulk of his actions I uh, am really taken with and impressed with, and I want to make sure you know that in my tone. Uh, I will quickly tell you the story of the experiences I had with young people uh, for years in my class. I taught the American History Survey class. We had at that time at the Boulderado restaurant a place called the Theodore Roosevelt Grill. I added an option for my American History Survey class. The students could write a two-page paper reckoning with the complexity of Theodore Roosevelt and saying, concluding, how one should feel when having lunch at the Theodore Roosevelt Grill, given the man's complexity. So it was a trick because the 200 students, they would say, is this an added assignment you didn't tell us about? I'd say, totally optional. The winner will lunch with me at the Theodore Roosevelt Grill. Well, maybe six or seven people out of, out of 200 would write the essay. They were all declared winners, and I would then have, you'll notice the brilliance of this, I had filtered out the six or seven most motivated, most engaging students to have lunch with. So I would take them to lunch, and we would go in, and we would just go into the most intense conversations about, about Mr. Roosevelt. The poor waiter would come to the table and say, well, uh, what can I get you in for beverages? We'd say, well, you know, beverages, we'll talk about that in a minute, but how does it feel to work at the Theodore Roosevelt Grill? We get back to the beverages? So, anyway, so that was um, a great experience and just a wonderful way. To, I sort of thought of them as the Roosevelt Grill Scholars. It was such a treat to have them. Uh, one day, a student who was one of the Roosevelt 
scholars came in and she looked very distressed and she said, I have terrible news. I said, oh, there's something wrong with your family? And she said, oh, no, they're fine, but I walked by and they're remodeling the Theodore Roosevelt Grill and they're giving it another name. Oh, so I have been looking for years for a restaurant named after an old dead guy with a complicated heritage that I could take students to. And if anyone can help me with that during the reception, that would be <laughs> welcome. So, and there will be a reception afterwards. I should say the format. Mr. Roosevelt will join me in a second. I think he is checking at the bit. Those of you who are feeling the vibrations back there, he is really ready to come up here. I will interview him for 35 or 40 minutes. Um, you'll all have a chance, the audience will have a chance to ask questions for another 15 or 20 minutes. Then he will speak he will uh, sum up his remarks to us, and then he will cease to be Thomas Jefferson and become Clay Jenkinson. Mr. Jenkinson will reflect for four or five minutes about this curious experience of inhabiting or being inhabited by Theodore Roosevelt, and then when we're exhausted by the effort to be what it would be like to be Theodore Roosevelt, then we will uh, refresh ourselves at the refreshment, that's why they call it, refreshments there at the reception afterwards. So, ladies and gentlemen, President Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Ms. Roosevelt, I hope it's not uncomfortable for you to be out with a group of people, or I hope you're not a shy person. I hope that you won't be ill at ease with the fact that there are people here looking at you. Is this, are you finding this to be, would you, can we calm you down in any way, or is there... I don't know about you, but I feel as fit as a bull moose. <laughs> I feel as strong as a hickory nut. <laughs> I'm stripped to the box and my hat is in the ring. And if it weren't so late in the evening, I would suggest that we adjourn immediately and hike to Golden. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm, I'm delighted, absolutely delighted to be here. I, I wish you would. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And I, I think we might just start off really at the heart. You notice you have one of your colleagues or friends there. I guess not Bull Moose, but I don't think I killed this one. No. So your record as a conservationist is almost beyond belief. Could you tell us how you became a conservationist? And because the word has gotten a little bit complicated in our time. Make sure you tell us what that meant for you to think of yourself as a conservationist. I went out to Dakota Territory in 1883 to kill a buffalo. I reckoned that the buffalo were on the brink of extinction. You know, at one time there had been 60 million buffalo in the American West. And by the autumn of 1883, there perhaps were 2,000 left in America. They were on the edge of what I assumed would be the extinction of America's greatest quadruped. And I wanted to get one before that happened. <laughs> and so I went out to Dakota, and after a very difficult hunt, I got my buffalo, and I, I did a little American Indian dance around it to celebrate. And I had it stuffed, and I took it back to Sagamore, where you can still see it today, but then I reckoned that this was really the germ of my conservation activities. I reckoned if I wanted to kill a buffalo, and I can tell you why, but if I wanted to kill one, then I wanted my son to be able to kill one and his grandson to be able to kill one. And if we let it go extinct, that primordial American experience of man versus a great beast would be gone forever. And so I thought... I will create an organization, the Boone and Crockett Club, to preserve the numbers of these herds of buffalo and elk and antelope and so on, so that they will always be a part of the American West. And so conservation is really wise use for sustained yield over a long period of time. That's, that's how it started. I am just a little bit puzzled that your love for animals is pretty darn hard on the animals you love. <laughs> That's absolutely wrong, of course. I just said that when I first killed a buffalo, there were just a handful of them, and by the time I, I, I passed from the scene, 
there were several hundred thousand bison, so we, we regenerated the herd. Everyone knows that hunting is essential to conservation. In fact, the great conservationists are almost invariably men who hunt because they understand the fragility of nature and they want to sustain these animals. So I will not accept this, this notion that I think you have that someone who hunts is bloodthirsty and can't really have bona fides in conservation. It's just the opposite of that. Maybe we could shift to an animal that uh, seems a little more defenseless, the, a bird. You adore birds. Birds guide you and orient you on the planet. And yet, how many birds did you kill? Thousands. <laughs> but I didn't bring any bird to the brink of extinction, just the opposite. You know what? I think that I saw the last carrier pigeon. You know, they were widely assumed to have gone extinct. They had once been one of the most numerous birds in the New World, and suddenly they, were, they blinked out. But I, my wife, Edith, while I was president, found us a little retreat down near Charlottesville in Virginia, and we called it Pine Knot. And we used to go there and just rough it, the two of us. We'd leave the children back in Washington. We would go to Pine Knot to, to recuperate our spirits. And it was as rustic a place as you could possibly imagine. Edith chose it. And I believe that while I was there one day during my first term, I saw the last authentic sighting of that pigeon. Did you kill it? No, of course not. <laughs> but unfortunately, it didn't have another bird to mate with. And so... That one we couldn't save, but we saved the buffalo when they were trying to take all of the feathers of the pelicans and the egrets for ladies' hats. I stepped in in 1903. I, I know you know this story. They were taking these beautiful birds, egrets and pelicans, amongst the greatest birds in North America, and they were killing them just to pluck the feathers to put on ladies' hats. I regard that as game butchery. And so I called in my Attorney General, Philander Knox, and I said to him, Attorney General Knox, is there any law on the books of the United States Code that would enable me to declare a federal bird sanctuary? Do you know what he said? No, no Mr. President, there is not. And so I said, well, let me ask a more interesting question. Is there any law on the books that would prohibit me from naming a bird sanctuary? He said, well, no, Mr. President, there is not. I said, I do declare it. And by executive order alone, I designated the first federal bird sanctuary, the Pelican Island in the Indian River in Florida. And after that, in the course of my presidency, I named 50 more. I am the father, by executive order alone, of the National Wildlife Refuge System. And I saved the egrets and the pelicans from that abominable business of ladies' attire. And you did that without constitutional authority. I did it. No, I did not do it without constitutional authority. I did it by stretching the Constitution to its limits. <laughs> but I did not exceed the President's authority. You know, here's the difference between me and this Mr. Jefferson. Jefferson was a great man and a beautiful architect and, and quite a good writer. Well, let me just stop there to say, you all revere this Jefferson, because he wrote 22,000 letters, and he wrote an American classic, Notes on the State of Virginia. I want to tell you that I am the writingest president in American history. <laughs> Jefferson wrote 22,000 letters, and you, you bow down in reverence to them. I wrote 150,000 letters. Jefferson wrote one book, Notes on the State of Virginia. I wrote 40 books. And a number of them are regarded as American classics. My autobiography of 1913, my four-volume Winning of the West, I'm sure you've read that book, my book on African game trails, and my work for my adventure in South America in 1913 and 14. I wrote 40 books. I'm the writingest president in the history of this country. You know who's the second writingest president? John Quincy Adams. He wrote 12 books. I will give a hundred dollar bill to anyone who can name one book that he wrote. <laughs> he wrote 12 books and they're all unreadable. 
So let's not be talking about Mr. Jefferson as if he's some sort of a saint in this culture. I'm not sure that I was. <laughs> but here's his theory. This yes. was Jefferson's theory of the Constitution. He argued that the government of the United States could only do those things which were specifically enumerated in the Constitution. That's his theory. You know what my theory is? The government can do anything that is not specifically prohibited in the Constitution. Do you see the difference? I see the difference. If you had followed Jefferson's system, you'd be living in a little straight-jacketed agrarian world. You'd be a powerless nation. We are an industrial nation we are an urban nation, and we are the mightiest people on earth, and we cannot continue to govern ourselves with that 18th century instrument designed by Newtonians. Oh, I think in that spirit, could you tell us about forest reserves and your creation? I'm really just following through on your various dimensions as such a... Oh, you're going to regard that as extra-constitutional? Uh, I will wait to, I'll ask them. What I'll do is I'll defer to them. A wise choice, say, yes. Yes. Here's what happened. As you know, the Timber Act had been passed many years before I accidentally became the president of this country. That act was already in place, and it empowered the president to designate certain properties in the public domain as national forest. And all of the presidents before me had designated about 50 million acres. I said, let's get busy. And so as the President of the United States, I designated 150 million new acres of national forest, quite a few of them right here in Colorado. And in doing so, we brought scientific management to the timber industry for the first time in American history. It was perfectly lawful, as you know, for me to do this. Mm -hmm. I just took it more seriously than my predecessors. And what did you do on that uh, week in response to Congressman Fulton? Oh, yes, I see what you're, where you're headed with this. How should I? Let me explain this. As I said, I was an accidental president. I was the governor of New York after my heroism in Cuba. And I was a reformist governor in New York. And the bosses, the Republican old guard of New York, didn't like me very much. They wanted me to cooperate with bossism and corruption and the status quo, and I refused. And so finally, Boss Platt, Thomas Platt, the senator from New York, called in his cronies and said, what shall we do about this nuisance Roosevelt? I was going to stand for another term as governor. And one of his well-intentioned friends said, I have a perfect solution. We'll nominate Roosevelt for the vice presidency, and he will never be heard from again. <laughs> When Boss Platt did that, I did not want to be the Vice President of the United States. What a cul-de-sac is that? <laughs> but I did it because the people, of course, wanted me to take that office, and we must, we must accept the will of the people. So I did it. Well, when I was nominated, Mark Hanna of Ohio, the kingmaker who had made McKinley president, said, gentlemen, what have you done? Now there is only one life between that madman and the presidency. <laughs> and he said to William McKinley, his closest friend, Bill, your duty now is to continue breathing for four more years. <laughs> this was meant to stop my rise. I rose like a rocket. Well, as you know, McKinley was assassinated on September 6, 1901 in the Music Temple at the the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, and I ascended into the presidency, as it were, through the back door. I said to one of my friends, Henry Cabot Lodge, this isn't the way I would have chosen to be president, but it wouldn't be any good to be morbid about it either. <laughs> so now I'm the accidental president of the United States. I wanted desperately to win a term in my own right. I did not want to be an asterisk. And so in 1904, even though presidents couldn't campaign on their own behalf, I made sure the American people knew I, I would like a second term. And I'm happy to announce that I was re-elected by the largest plurality ever in the Electoral College up till that time, and the greatest popular vote in the history of this country. I said, now look what I will do. But I will tell you this. By... 1908, as I near the end of my second term, 
There was, I suppose, what you would call a little bit of Roosevelt fatigue in the country. (laughs) People just felt a little exhausted. And so a reaction began to set in. And I had made a mistake. I had declared on election night in 1904 that I would not seek a third term. And in doing so, I became a sort of lame duck. Well, in 1908, Charles Fulton, a senator from Oregon, fed up with my executive order, Federal Reserves of Trees, put a rider in a key agricultural appropriations bill that said no more national forests in six northwestern states, Washington and Oregon and California and Idaho and Montana and so on. So no further presidential designations of forest reserves in those six states. It was one of those riders put on a bill of such importance that you cannot veto it. And so I had no choice but to sign it. I was putting myself in a straitjacket. But I had to sign it or the country would collapse. We need a line item veto. But that's another story. (laughs) Well, I checked the Constitution. And discovered, of course, that there is an interim between the time Congress gets a bill to the president's desk and that moment when he must sign it. And so I called over to Gifford Pinchot in agriculture, and I said, let's get busy. (laughs) And during that 10-day period, we designated 16 million new acres of national forest. (laughs) All of them in those states. And in Charles Fulton's Oregon, we added some extras just for him. (laughs) And he came to me, and he was shaking and livid and pale and effeminate. (laughs) He said, you have done an extra constitutional thing. You have behaved in a a monarchical way. You have violated the protocols of the Senate of the United States. You know what I said? Impeach me. And he went away and later went to federal prison, may I say. (laughs) And that was perfectly constitutional. And the executive orders by which I created the bird sanctuaries, constitutional. Altogether, in my seven years and 171 days as president, I set aside 230 million acres of the lands of America as permanently protected from adverse economic development. And I will say to you, name to me any president in your history who has done that much. You give many signs of running for office. President, is that... Well, I shouldn't ask. No, I, made, I, a, I made a terrible that's, mistake. Well, I know. And besides that, you're dead. So that's... It's, but, that's a, but I can never quite get it out of my system. You know, I see say, that. I see that. I left office, I suppose you'd call it voluntarily. In 1909, I would have been re-elected, of course, to a third term and a fourth, and probably for life, for that matter. But I had made that silly vow. On the night of my triumph, I had brought up consulting Edith. I had turned to reporters and said, oh, Washington's precedent of two terms is a wise protection and blah, blah, blah. And I said, therefore, I will regard the three years and 171 days that I have spent filling in for McKinley as, as it were my first term. And now that I've been elected in my own right, I shall regard the next four years as my second term. And therefore, gentlemen, there is no circumstance under which I will agree to stand for re-election in the year 1908. Even I gasped at that. (laughs) I was asked many, many times over the rest of my life, Colonel Roosevelt, did you ever regret having made that rash vow? Do you know what I said? Only once. Every day for the rest of my life. I said I would take a Bowie knife and literally cut off this arm here to take it back. And if I had taken it back and stood for a third term, I would have been elected and the bosses would have understood because, of course, their coinage is duplicity. But I knew that if I did that, there would be people in Broken Bow, Nebraska, and Wadena, Minnesota, and Butte, Montana, who would lose respect for me and more importantly, lose respect for the process. And so although it almost killed me, I left office voluntarily in 1999. I said this, I said to the American people, 
I promise you that no president has ever enjoyed being president as much as I have done. And no family has ever enjoyed living in this house as much as we Roosevelt's. And then I named my successor, William Howard Taft, and went on a year-long safari in Africa. I'd always wanted to go on a safari in Africa, and now I did it. And I did it in part to give him a chance to establish his own presidential regimen. And I don't mean to sound egotistical, but imagine following me. <laughs> so I went on a year-long safari in Africa to get out of harm's way, and as I left, as I left this country, my old antagonist, Pierpont Morgan of Wall Street, issued a statement. He said, we understand that former President Roosevelt now goes on a year-long safari in Africa. Wall Street expects every lion to do its duty. <laughs> so President, I, it's a little hard to get in there sometimes with you, but I just want to make... This is the first time in your life that you've had to compete. <laughs> <laughs> well, I usually do a little better at this, it's true. But I would like to just look very directly at you, and I would like to ask you, you, are speak, you speak endlessly about the people and representing the people. You just mentioned the folks in Butte and so on. In Wadena. In Wadena. Uh, the attitude of Westerners towards you and your unilateral, top-down, one could even say authoritarian actions. I want to know what, how that works for you to be talking all the time about the people and to see yourself as really above them and able to take actions that their elected representatives in Congress are shut out of, that you won't... I'm still looking at you. <laughs> well, are you finished now? Because I will answer when you're ready. Okay. Go ahead. okay. I, just, I would like to know how that coexists in your mind. Is it hypocrisy? Is it inconsistency? Is it obliviousness to the fact that you are not a consistent person? I don't know how to explain the electoral system to you. But the fact is that I made my principles known at an early point in my life, and I was elected to the vice presidency, and then I was resoundingly re-elected. The people who opposed me were capitalists who wanted to protect their greed, what I like to call malefactors of great wealth. Of course, in certain limited places where there were restrictions on grazing or restrictions on water use, the local people would be a little miffed. But the great mass of Americans understood what I was getting at. I had the capacity to persuade them. And may I say, and I don't know how to say this without sounding a little self-reflective, but I'm a war hero. I'm a cowboy. I'm a rancher. I've arrested thieves and, and taken them as a deputy voluntary sheriff to justice. I have, I have punched out drunkards in bars. I was a hero to the average citizens of this country. They saw me as themselves only multiplied in energy. And so that gave me a mandate. And even though the bosses hated me and the, the timber barons hated me and Morgan hated me and so on, they understood two things. Number one, I had the average people of this country behind me and they didn't dare thwart that. And secondly, this is more important, the, the great capitalist barons understood that if they didn't allow me to reform capitalism, that there was going to be a socialist revolution in this country. In other words, I'm a conservative reformist, and I took the industrial world that had overtaken this country, and I chastened it just enough so that it provided a square deal for all of our citizens. And in doing that, I saved capitalism, and Morgan knew it. He wouldn't admit it, but he knew it. Congress has powers in the Constitution. I know you know that. Your opinions of Congress do not seem to reflect those have you, delegated powers. Have you ever observed Congress? <laughs> May I just appeal to the sovereign here? It would be so much easier to govern this country without Congress. <laughs> Take 
Panama. I took the canal zone. I sent the Army Corps of Engineers. I eradicated yellow fever and malaria. I did it. And of course, everyone abused me, just the way you're doing. Oh, you're high-handed, Mr. President. Oh, you behave like a king. Oh, you, you've trampled upon constitutional niceties. You know what I say to that? I say, yes, of course, I probably should have put this idea of an Isthmian canal to the Senate. And then the Senate would have debated it. And had I done that, they would be debating it tonight. <laughs> and so instead, I just did it, and now they can debate me for the rest of time. Do you see the genius of that? I see so. The Senate consists of little constituency men who, who handle passport problems for, their, for the people back home. These are men who have never done a good day's work in their life. They've never killed a bear. The Senate consists of a, a shrill concatenation of eunuchs. And so I was the first real man who had been president since Lincoln. And I wasn't going to let Congress stand in the way. I've never noticed before that the word mandate begins with such a man aspect of it. You do inflect that in a way that... <laughs> oh dear me. But I just, I fear, and I think I have reason to fear that this group is being swept away by your charm. Very understandable. But I would like to ask you to talk about um, Negroes. Negroes. What would you like me to say? What is your attitude towards them, towards their well, capacities, me, their place in society? Let me start with, of course, the famous anecdote that when I first became president, I had been a friend for a very long time with Booker T. Washington. You've heard of him, haven't you? He was a Negro from the South, the Tuskegee Institute, and he was what is known as a gradualist or an accommodationist. He believed that the Negroes needed to move slowly into a, into a greater access to the fruits of American life. And I agreed with that very much, this gradualism. So, I, was, I had known him for a long time, and I met with him in Washington, D.C. when I was first president. It was October 16, 1901. We met, and we were talking about appointments to Southern postmasterships and so on. And I was trying very carefully to appoint Negroes to these posts, but you have to do it with great surgical care because the white southerners were so vicious about their Jim Crow laws. And so he and I were consulting, and it grew late in the day, and I said, you know, Booker, we, I, I'm sorry I've consumed your day. Why don't you just stay and have supper with Edith and the children and me? And so he did. And he became the third, and you can imagine this, this is now the year 1901. And on the 16th of October, 1901, the Negro leader Booker T. Washington became the first black man ever to dine in the White House. Can you imagine that? The first black guest ever to dine in the White House. I didn't even think about it. The next day, pandemonium broke loose in this country. I received more criticism for that act of hospitality than for anything else I ever did as president. The Memphis, Tennessee newspaper, The Scimitar, <coughs> called that moment, quote, the most damnable outrage in the history of the Republic. Can you imagine that? The most damnable outrage in the history of the Republic. A Richmond, Virginia newspaper said, and I will not use the word, they said, if the president dines an M, we suppose the president believes that white people and Negroes shall now mix indiscriminately in our social settings. And we further believe, said that Richmond newspaper, that the president must want black men to sleep with our white women. All that from supper. <laughs> the backlash was astounding. But I never regretted that. And so, here's my theory. Slavery was a poison, and thank goodness Lincoln settled that problem once and for all, the greatest of all American presidents. But the Jim Crow laws were a setback for the Negro, and now that the 20th century was looming, we needed to reincorporate them carefully and gradually into American life. There were, during my presidency, more than 100 lynchings per year, many of them in the North. 
And so I wanted a slow approach. And I, but I will say this much in criticism of our Negro brethren. I like Booker T. Washington. I like Person X, Person Y, Person Z. But I do not like tribes of any sort. I don't like the Sioux. I don't like the Hungarians. I don't like the Chinese. I don't like the Irish. When you are an Irish person who comes to this country, when you get to Ellis Island, check your ethnicity at the gate. I do not like Irish Americans or any other hyphenated Americans. I like Americans. And I will not have the Negro Americans as a phalanx or the Crow Indians as a phalanx. I want everyone to, to be absorbed in the great citizenship of this country. And so I'm rather hard on, on Negro solidarity. Would you tell us about race suicide and your fears for the position of... Well, you're just trying to put me in a bad light. Well, you put yourself in a very good light, and I appreciate that, but I think these folks are interested in the full story. Well, I think we can all agree here. There is one race of people and one race only that are fit to rule the world, the Anglo-Saxon people. And all other peoples are less. It's that simple. And the problem was that the Anglo-Saxons have reduced their birth rate to almost nothing, and everybody else is breeding like rabbits. And so I gave speeches around this country decrying race suicide. And I really felt that the Anglo-Saxons would be overwhelmed by the Slavic temperaments of the world. So I preached over and over against race suicide. And I mean it very, very earnestly. Men in this room, I want to talk to each one of you. <laughs> I want you to become exemplars of the strenuous life. And when I look out on you, if I may speak boldly, I don't see much strenuosity. <laughs> I see a lot of desk men. I see a lot of pencil pushers. I see some effeminacy. And I see, may I say, men whose shoulders resemble nothing so much as a champagne bottle. <laughs> this was not Daniel Boone. This country was proved up by your ancestors who had the right gumption. And so to the men in this room, I say, you must get out and do something. Climb something. Build something. Shoot something. <laughs> and to the women in this room, if you are mated to one of these men... I urge you to turn and look at him for a moment and ask yourself this question. What happened? <laughs> we Anglo-Saxons must get strenuous. And women, you must have large numbers of children. My daughter Alice, you've heard of her, of course, was so appalled by this race suicide lecture that I like to give that she and some of her sophisticated friends from the Newport 400 formed something called the Race Suicide Club, which they vowed never to marry and never to breed. <laughs> but of course she did marry and she did have one child. Uh, speaking of children, thank you for your full disclosure. I think that was important for everyone and I... Well, I appreciate you doing that. Uh, I would like to talk about you as a child. The, but before we do that, you in the company of children, that was something to see. You were kind of exuberant in the company of kids. My wife, Edith, once said, you must understand that Theodore is my sixth child. <laughs> The British ambassador to the United States, my very good friend, Cecil Spring Rice, when asked by another diplomat about my behavior, said it's not such a puzzle. You must understand that Roosevelt is about 12 years old. <laughs> so there is a bit of what might be called the puer eternus in me. I love life. I love children. And children love me because I'm uninhibited around them. I wrestle with them. I take them on foot races. 
I am happy to swim with them. And you, I don't know if you know this. You, I know that you've, you've gotten into shape and you are now an advocate of the strenuous life. So let me give you some advice. Thank you. Uh, we played a game at Sagamore called Point to Point. Have you heard of it? Oh, we had, of course, my six children and then the cousins and the nephews and so on and so forth, a very large group, and we would meet there. And I was the referee, and I would say, you're it. And so whoever was it would point to something on the far horizon and say, that. And then we would form a single space line, and then we would march to that place. But the question was, you can never go around anything. If we came to a pond, we waded through it. If we came to a barn, we went in the front door and out the back. If we came to a haystack, up and over, and a tree, and so on, point to point. And if anybody deviated a millimeter, they were sent home in ignominy. <laughs> this builds character. <laughs> so, when I was president of the United States, we played it there, too. And I would take foreign diplomats and cabinet ministers and key senators and representatives to Rock Creek, and we played point to point. And one time, I took the diplomatic corps, and they, oh, we got to the Rock Creek, and unfortunately, this was around 1904, we got to Rock Creek, and it was, it was swollen with a spring flood. So what to do? Well, of course, I did the logical thing. I stripped naked and walked through the creek. And then I turned to the entire diplomatic establishment and said, come along. Well, they were mighty hesitant. But I browbeat them into doing it. And so they each stripped down and bundled their clothes up and came through the creek. One and only one diplomat refused, the French ambassador. Jules Jusserand. He was a good friend of mine, but he lacked a little of the manly spirit. And so I said, bye, Joe, man, you're in America now. Let's see what you've got. <laughs> and so with the greatest sense of hesitation and, and, and ennui, he took off his clothes and folded them with garlic fastidiousness. <laughs> and he put them into a neat little bundle, and then he walked naked as the day he was born through Rock Creek. But as he came through, I noticed that he was still wearing his diplomatic gloves. So here's an entirely naked Frenchman with diplomatic gloves. I said to him, what can this possibly mean, Jusserand? You know what he said? In case we meet later. <laughs> point to point, it builds character. I see that. Yeah. As a as a child, that would have been a very hard. You would have found that a very hard game to play. As a child, you could not have played that. I was a ninety eight pound weakling. I know you don't understand that now, but it was true. I had crippling asthma. I was so crippled up from asthma, which was not understood at the time that I was told by our family physicians that I should not expect to achieve adulthood. It ruined our family life. Everything revolved around my malady. My father would hire a, a carriage and we'd go along the cobbled streets of New York so that it could force oxygen into my decrepit lungs. I was pathetic. I was an invalid. I couldn't go to school. I couldn't go on outings. I couldn't sustain anything. And finally, after a very, very difficult summer, my father hauled me aside. My father, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., the greatest man I ever knew and the only one I ever feared. And he took me aside and he said, Theodore, your mind is strong, but your body is weak. He said, you will never achieve your potential if your body lags behind your great spirit. He said, I'm going to challenge you, my son, today. You must make your body. You know what I said? I looked up at him and I said, I will, Papa. I will make my body. He bought me a home gymnasium kit. And I began to lift weights and do jumping jacks and sit-ups and push-ups. And I even learned a little of the science of pugilism. And slowly I dragged my frail and worthless body out of decrepitude into something like strenuosity. But even at Harvard, I think you went to Harvard, even at Harvard, women were not allowed then. 
Even at Harvard, when I graduated, my personal physician said, Mr. Roosevelt, you have a weak heart and a poor constitution. You should not expect to live very long. He said, during the few months or years you have remaining to you, I urge you to lead an entirely sedentary life. He said, for example, I urge you never to bound up a flight of stairs. I turned to him and I said, Doctor, because of this, I am going to bound up every flight of stairs I ever come to because I would rather die young than be a decrepit invalid. If I can do it, so can you. I have no patience with self-pitying people. And so I am proud that I overcame this weakness. And I went out to Dakota, as you know. Yes. And I think I showed myself as something of an authentic cowboy there. Yes, and I, I want, I have just a few more minutes of your time before. We're I, just getting started. Okay. I, I feel the same way. I totally feel the same well, way. But, well, uh, well, we could test them. We'll see. We could test their strenuosity. We'll for see that. what they've got. Right, but, but what I would do is ask you just two more topics. The first one you will hate and you will not want to do it. And then. Well, then let's skip it. <laughs> I think that I think it is important, and I appreciate that your willingness to not steer entirely on your charm and to let them. I'm see not what, charming. Oh no, no! I'm just a very exuberant man. Right. This next topic won't show you in that mode, but the reward will be that you will and our little session together by getting to tell some of your Wild West stories. So, let's just go right to that. No, let's not do that. Okay. Uh, you charge through life. And up San Juan Hill. Wasn't that Kettle Hill? Was First that Kettle, then San Juan. Okay, good. Get okay. it right. Thank you. Um, and yet, uh, frailty follows you. You've defeated it in your own Yes. Exercise, yes. but death and frailty and illness, you could not escape that. Well, nobody can. We all die, don't we? And friends and relatives and very close relatives do. You're not, so one that you're not going to bring up I am, the subject. I am going to ask you to tell these people about your encounters with grief. You have to promise not to cry. I know this story, and I have brought my hand. I don't like to tell this story. I was married in 1880 to an extraordinarily beautiful young woman by the name of Alice Hathaway Lee. She was a diminutive blonde with beautiful blue eyes, and she was a society swell from the Boston area. And she was my happiness. I was the youngest member ever of the New York State Assembly, and my career was taking off in a marvelous way. I had written several books, and there were many more in the works. I had two ranches out in Dakota, and I was married. And she became pregnant, and she gave birth to our child, Alice, the famous Alice Roosevelt, on February 12, 1884. And the birth was a little premature, and I was up in Albany doing the state's business. And I, I received a telegram up there congratulating me that I was now a father and that my wife was doing quite well. And so there were congratulatory resolutions passed and cigars passed about, and even my enemies were clapping me upon the back. And it was one of the great moments of my life. Less than 24 hours later, we received a second telegram which said that my wife, Alice, was gravely ill and dying. She had been struck by Bright's disease, which is a total collapse of the kidney function. And I should hasten home as quickly as possible to Manhattan. That was the longest train ride of my life. I got to my home at about 11.30 p.m. on the 13th of February, 1884, and my brother Elliot opened the door. And the first thing he said was, Theodore, there is a curse on this house. For you see, my wife was dying at the age of 23. And on the same night, my mother was dying too. Mitty, my beloved mother from Georgia, 49 years old, was dying of typhus. And so I went upstairs and sat by her side, and she died in the middle of the night. 
And then a few hours later, I held my beloved little wife, Alice, in my arms, and she died too. In short, the two most important women of my life died simultaneously on Valentine's Day, 1884. I wrote in my little pocket diary, the light has gone out of my life forever. I went out to my ranch in Dakota and I threw myself into reckless, strenuous activity. My grief was overwhelming. I expected never to return to the East, and I would live the rest of my life as a cowboy and rancher, and maybe become a governor of the new state of Dakota. But I was done with New York. That summer, I wrote this. Black care seldom sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. Black care seldom sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. That increased the strenuosity of my life by a good bit. I gave my daughter, who was a very healthy child, to my sister Bammy to raise. And I said, I'll come back from time to time to see her and to, to, to give you funds for her for education and so on. And I said, and also to publish books and take care of financial affairs. But I said, there is one condition that I never, under any circumstance, when I come back to New York, want to see a certain woman by the name of Edith Carroll. We had been childhood sweethearts. Something had gone wrong. I had married Alice instead, and Edith did not take that as well as she might have done. <laughs> so I did not ever want to be in her presence again. And so I come back in the fall of 1885, and I'm going into the foyer of our house, and who should be coming down the stairs but Edith? It was highly awkward. <laughs> then there was a second awkward meeting, and a third, and a kind of thaw in our friendship, followed by a, a secret engagement. It was a little hasty for the Victorian era. Of course, anything was a little hasty for the Victorian era. And I kept it a secret, and finally Bambi found out about it. She found out before I told her, and she was very upset with me. And I said, nobody, Bambi, can be as upset with me as I am. I despise second marriages. They show a weakness of fidelity. They show a lack of discipline. They show a certain... May I call it concupiscence? <laughs> and I said, it almost makes me hope there is no heaven. Because if in heaven we meet all those we knew in life, this could produce a bit of awkwardness. <laughs> and so slowly I, I recovered, and, and Edith and I had five more children, Theodore, Kermit, Ethel, Archibald, and little Quentin, I think. And I would not be sitting here had it not been for Edith. I never talk, I never talk about my first wife. I wouldn't talk about her to my child, Alice. She would say, tell me, Papa, about my mother. I'd say, no, go to your grandparents. And in my autobiography of 1930, which historians regard as one of the best by any president, I never once mentioned my first marriage. And so I don't want to talk about it, but I'm sorry you brought it up going to get worse. Could you tell us about your brother Elliot? My brother Elliot was my hero. He was everything that I was not. I was decrepit, I was frail, I was an invalid, I was mousy, and he was a young, virile man, a hunter and a, and a great scholar. He, he, I looked up to him, I worshipped him as a kind of a, an Apollonian god. And then he behaved like so many other aristocrats at this time. He became an alcoholic and a womanizer and a drug addict. And he died tragically young. I despise that. And for that reason, may I say, I'm a sarsaparilla man myself. I don't drink spiritus liquors. That was one of the great blows of my life, Elliot. And now it gets, this is the part that gets worse your son. Well, you all know the story 
of how I put together a harem scarum group of Rough Riders and went off to Cuba. I wrote that up with the Rough Riders, which is one of my best books. Because of that, I was swept into the governorship of New York, and as you know, into the vice presidency and so on. And so that Cuban enterprise not only tested me and made me a true national figure, but it redeemed our family reputation. Because you see, my father, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., did not fight in the Civil War. He should have done it, but he didn't because my mother was a Confederate. And she asked him not to serve, and so he didn't. He did other foundation work. He was very active in the Union cause, but he didn't fight. He hired proxies. And the hiring of proxies I regard as despicable. So when my moment came, and let me be serious for a moment, from a pretty early time, I wanted to be a leader of this country. And from a fairly early time, I reckoned that someday, somehow, I might become the President of the United States. If you want to be the President, and a war happens under your best years, you must get yourself into that war, and you must fight at the front. Why? Because the president may have to do the most difficult thing that any statesman can ever do. He might have to send your children off to war. And how dare a president send your children off to war if he shirked that opportunity himself in his own time. Do you understand? If you are going to send somebody else's children into harm's way, you had better have gotten there yourself. And so I went to Cuba, and I was a hero. And the only thing I regretted, may I speak honestly, I said much later, the only thing I regretted is that I did not receive some, or, some form of ghastly wound. <laughs> Something that would mark me for the rest of my life, but I did just a few shrapnel sorts of things. So then World War I came, and that little pathetic Wilson finally got enough gumption, let us call it, to take us into the war. He had the backbone of a chocolate eclair. <laughs> and finally, he was goaded into a declaration of war, and I went to him immediately. I was in my late 50s by now, and my health was broken. That South American trip was very difficult. And I went to Wilson half in hand, and I said, I want you to let me gather up one more harem scarum group of rough riders, and I'll go off to France and lead a charge for this country. Wilson said no. Oh, I had been pretty abusive of him in the press. <laughs> so some of this may have been revenge, but I could have accepted that, but he hurt my feelings. He said, Colonel Roosevelt, war has changed. It's industrial warfare now, and there's no room for your sort of romantic charge with cavalry. He said, you'd only really get in the way. That broke my heart. I would quite like to have died in the fields of France. So I went home, I had four sons, and I said to them, boys, you are Roosevelt's. You are all going to war, and you are not going to hang back in desk jobs, you're going to get yourself to the front, and you're going to fight for this country because you are Roosevelt's. They all went. And the girls went too. They went as nurses and Red Cross volunteers and so on. But the boys went to fight. All of them were wounded. All of them received awards and honors for their heroism. But unfortunately, the youngest of them and my favorite, Quentin, did not come back. He was an early pilot, an aerialist, a dogfighter. And on the 14th of July, 1918, in France in a dog fight with the Hun, he was shot down and killed. A telegram came to Sagamore. Edith and I were there alone. I knew immediately what it meant. I accepted it and I went into a room and shut the door for an hour. When I came out, I told my personal secretary I must now do the most difficult thing that I have ever done in the whole course of my life. I must go tell his mother. That was a difficult one. But rather than that he should have lived, I would have seen all of my children die if they had hung back.
you said you could tell Wild West tales. Can I tell one? It's a little bit hard as a transition. I can make it work. Oh, can you? Because it seems really hard. I can make it work. I don't want to stay in grief. Black hair seldom sits behind a rider. But doesn't, isn't that what enough. makes you... I don't know exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm reacting here, but it seems like the times that I've heard you tell that story, it is the fact that you have to just jump back in with a Wild West tale. Well, what you else are you going to do? Wallow in your grief and give up on the struggle of life? Have you not read Darwin? It's a jungle. The fittest survive. All great nations have been warring nations. And all great men have a little of the wolf in them. And if you can't accept the struggle of life, get out of the arena. I'm serious. You mustn't wallow in self-pity and grief. All of you have known loss. Is there anyone in this room who has not known loss? So get up and get in the saddle and get back on your feet. You know, I put it this way at the Sorbonne in 1910 when I gave that speech on citizenship after a, by safari. I went on a grand tour of Europe. And at the Sorbonne in France, I gave a speech on citizenship and I said the famous thing that you all heard. It's not the critic who counts. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, for there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great devotions, the great enthusiasms, and spends himself wholly in a worthy cause. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. If you can't stand the arena, you are not an American. Wow. Now may I tell my story? Yes, that's a good idea. You'll love this story, and then we'll take some questions. Yes, okay. Good. I'm sure they have some thoughts. I know they do. I, I tend to go a little long. I like to talk. Could you tell about your wife's reactions to your talking? Well, I would have these dinner parties at the White House, and I'd be holding forth about the Nibelungen lead, or Germanic character, or... Dante's Inferno, or hunting trips that I made in the West, and I'd be going on and on and on. And finally I'd look over, and there would be Edith. And she'd be giving me that look, husbands, do you know this look? <laughs> that look that says, you've said quite enough, Theodore. And then I would shrivel up a little, and I'd say, well, Edie, I was just about to finish. <laughs> and then she'd turn away, and I'd go right back to it. <laughs> I tend to speak a little long. You know, in 1912, during the Bull Moose campaign, I was shot. Do you know this story? It was a long and difficult campaign. I had the largest third party vote of any presidential candidate in your history, including up until your present time, but I lost. And late in the campaign, I was in Milwaukee, and I was to give a speech at a hall, but the local people wanted to take me out to supper. My handler said, no, Mr. Rosa, you must rest. And I said, no, I never wanted to displease the local coordinator. So off we went to dinner. And afterwards, we got into a jalopy to go off to the speech. And as I sat down in the jalopy, a, a filthy anarchist came up and shot me at point-blank range. I slumped to the floor of that automobile. Blood was pouring out of my chest. I said, he pinked me. Well, I'm an old hunter. And so I, I coughed, spittle into my hand. And when I noticed there was no blood in it, I realized that I might be wounded, but by no means mortally. Fortunately, I happened to have in the pocket of my greatcoat a steel spectacles case. And my 50-page speech folded up. And they together slowed the bullet. And so while it lodged in my ribs, it did not enter my lungs. And I was going to live. My handlers, of course, wanted to take me off to the emergency room. That's what handlers do. You know what I said? I said, I'm going to give this speech if it is the last speech I ever give. And off we went to the hall. And there, do you know this, I gave an 84-minute speech. Blood was pouring out of me. 
And my shirt was red, and I looked like a stuck pig. I held up copies of the speech and gave them away as souvenirs with the gold <laughs> And finally, after any book, well, I said, first of all, I said, ladies and gentlemen, I may not be at full strength tonight, because you see, I have just been assassinated. <laughs> but after 84 minutes, I was beginning to, to faint. And my handlers took me away, and they went off to the hospital. They, of course, they wanted to carry me in. I refused. I said, I'm going to walk into this hospital if it is the last stroll I ever made. And I lived. But my point is, I tend to go a little long. So let me tell the story. When I went out to Dakota, when I went out to Dakota, I wanted desperately to be an authentic cowboy. I had read the, the tales of Daniel Boone, George Rogers Clark, and Davy Crockett, and they, they were the, you know this, you're in Colorado. They're the ones who made this country's character. I know your friend Frederick Jackson Turner, the man of the frontier thesis. I had my own frontier thesis, but we agreed that what made America was civilization crossing beyond the last boundary and getting into the wilderness and encountering difficult things there, Indians and bears and coyotes and so on. That's what made us. And so I wanted to get a little of that in my own life. I was a Harvard man, and I was a New Yorker, and I had been brought up in great privilege, and so I wanted to get authentic. So I went out to Dakota, but I made some mistakes. When I first got off the train, I had had made for myself a designer suit of buckskins. The most beautiful buckskins you ever saw. The fringe was all perfectly level and beautifully calibrated. And I had a silver buckle engraved, silver spurs with T on one and R on the other, and a knife hand carved by Tiffany's. I was so proud of that costume, but some of the some of the ranchers and cowboys and desperados out there in Dakota thought that this was a little artificial. They called me a pumpkin lily and a carpetbagger and a, an interloper and a Harvard man, and they called me a dude. <laughs> a dude. They seemed to take some sort of moral righteousness over the fact that I wear spectacles. They called me four eyes. They called me storm windows. They called me shutters. And then I made things rather worse in my first roundup. You know, has any of you ever been on a roundup? Well, shame on you. In a roundup, you bring in the calves, and they are they're tied by their hooks and they're dragged into a central place, and there there's a person who holds that calf down while somebody snips off its testicles and puts a hot poker into its side. This is branding and castration. That calf comes in somewhat unwillingly. <laughs> and if they ever get out from under your grip, they are not coming back, believe me. So I did this work. I'm not a great ropist. I'm not a great rider. I am good at this sort of difficult work. I never complain. I never called attention to myself. I never spoke unless spoken to. I always got up earlier than the others, and I stayed up later than everybody, and I never was first in the grub line. And I accepted any duty that was offered to me because I wanted to be accepted. And so here I am, and they're bringing calf after calf after calf in, and it is mighty exhausting and dirty work. And over in the corner there, along the fence, was a cowboy who thought he was beautiful, and he was striking poses for the ladies. And he was flirting, and he was not paying attention. And because of that, some of the calves were squirting out of the circle. And so without even thinking about it, I looked over at him and I said, and I quote, hasten forward quickly there. <laughs> I said, hasten forward quickly there. And they all laughed. And for the rest of my time in Dakota, when I would see one of these men on the street, he'd say, well, hasten forward, Mr. Rosner. <laughs> and in the saloon in Medora, Dakota Territory, there was even a drink 
called the Hasten Forward. <laughs> so it took a little while before I was accepted. But let me tell you the moment that it came. I had two ranches, the, the Maltese Cross, seven miles south of the tracks, and, and my more remote and more beautiful ranch, the Elkhorn, which is 35 miles downriver. That is north. I had a bunch of horses, about 60 of them, and this was back when there were no fences, it was open range, and so these critters would, would scramble and wander all over the prairie. And I decided I needed to bring them in, and so I went out one day to, to ride the range and bring in the entire horse herd. And it got a little late and it got a little cold, and I hadn't brought sleeping gear. Luckily, I came to a little village on the Montana-Dakota border. That village was called Mingusville. Do you know why? Because the husband and wife who started the town were named Minnie and Gus. <laughs> Mingusville, that's the way of the West. So I went into this town, and it was a really shabby, awful little town. And I went into the only hotel known, so I got myself a room. And I said to the clerk, by Jove, I'm as hungry as a wolf. I should like a beefsteak. Where is a restaurant in this town? He said, there is no restaurant. He said, but you might be able to get a steak in the saloon. Well, I don't know about you, but I am not fond of saloons. The kind of men who go into saloons are looking for trouble. And may I speak freely? The kind of women who frequent saloons are not the sort you take home to meet Mama. Hurdy, <laughs> dirty girls, soiled doves, ladies of the night. Am I making myself clear? <laughs> so here's this saloon, and it was like a scene out of a dime novel. I opened the double doors and walked in. And immediately I realized that some sort of an incident was occurring. There was a drunken desperado with a gun in either hand, and he was shooting up the bar. It was like a scene out of Owen Wister. He shot at the feet of some of the men. The men were cowering behind chairs and stools. He shot the mirror. He shot bottles, and he shot the only clock in Montana. <laughs> what would you do if tonight when you left this talk you went into a bar and there was somebody with a pistol in either hand here's what I thought if I walk unobtrusively and without calling any attention to myself he might ignore me and I'll find an obscure table in the back and order my steak and be done with it <laughs> unfortunately he spied me he said, oh, it's Four Eyes. Four Eyes is here. He'll buy drinks for everybody. I ignored him and sat down at an obscure little table. He would not desist. He came up and he stood over me and I could smell his feet and breath. And he said again, I repeat, Four Eyes is standing drinks for the bar. What would you do? I told you earlier that I was something of a pugilist. And so I sat there and I looked at him for a moment, and I noticed that in his inebriation he had placed his boots rather too close together, and his center of gravity, therefore, was by no means adequate. And so the next time he both separated four eyes of standing drinks, I looked up at him and I said, Well, I suppose if I have to, I have to, and I rose. And as I rose, I hit him with a right, and then with a left, and another right, and down he went. And as he went down, both pistols were discharged. I might have been killed. It was the best moment of my life. Both pistols went off. I studied by myself to see if I were dead. And when I realized that I had lived, I jumped on his chest with my knees, well, fortunately, when I hit him, he fell and hit the back of his head on the bar and passed out cold. So I jumped on his chest and disarmed this ruffian. And now I saw a specimen of human nature. Remember those people who were cowering? Well, they all came up bravely now and said, rebuke to him. They, they called him a ruffian and a desperate. They cuffed him a little. 
We tied him up. We put him on a freight train, and he was never seen again. <laughs> I sat down in my chair, and I finished my beefsteak. I went up to my room, and I double locked the door. <laughs> And after that, they began to take me more seriously. You see, the strenuous life. Can I tell a closing remark about Dakota? I Just one. I have so not controlled the... You have, <laughs> I just can't. I'm so sorry. I, I feel that I have yielded to you quite a bit. But I, just want, I want to give you one passage from my autobiography. I want you to listen very carefully. Because, you know... Oh, it sounds like I'm some sort of a strenuous sort of guy and an adventurer, reckless and so on. But I could write prose. Ask yourself if Jefferson could have written this. <laughs> this is from the chapter called In Cowboy Land from my autobiography. Listen carefully. It was still the Wild West in those days. The West of Owen Wister's novels and Frederick Remington's sculpture and paintings. It was the West of the wild Indian and the, the buffalo soldier and, and the hunter and the rancher and the cowboy. We led a free and hardy life with horse and rifle. We worked under the scorching midsummer sun as the wide plains wavered and shimmered in the heat. We worked under the freezing misery of riding night guard around the cattle during the late fall roundup. In the soft springtime, the stars shone glorious in our eyes each night before we fell asleep. And in the winter, we rode through blinding blizzards in which the driven snow dust burnt our faces. There were, to be sure, monotonous times when we walked the trail herds of the beef cattle hour after hour at the slowest of paces. But minutes or hours teeming with excitement as we stopped stampedes or drove the herds through rivers brimmed with running ice and teeming with quicksand. We knew toil and hardship and hunger and thirst. And we saw men die as they worked amongst the horses and cattle or fought in evil feuds with one another. But for all of this, we felt the beat of hearty life in our veins, and ours was the glory of work and the joy of living. That's the frontier, you, the frontier historian. <laughs> Disproportionate, but if you could try for brevity in your questions, they it's should a be little like, bit yes. Yes, comical that we would ask for brevity at this point in the evening. But we'll if take we a few. Yes, so yes, yes, so you could answer some. Well, I don't know why. Let's hear one. Who has a question? <laughs> this woman right there. I see that. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. President, yeah. could you please explain what went into your passing of the Pure Food and Drug Act? Oh, the Pure Food and Drug Act. I don't have time to go into it in detail, but in 1906. A man named Upton Sinclair wrote a novel called The Jungle. Have you read it? Oh, it's a horrible book. <laughs> About the filth and the corruption and the waste and the, and the, and the lack of hygiene in our meatpacking industry. I read the book and I didn't agree with it. I'm sure he was making a lot of it up. So I wrote him a letter. I said, dear Upton Sinclair, I have read your book. I don't think that you're telling the truth about the meatpacking industry, but I'm going to investigate it. And if any of these things is true, I promise I shall attend to them. But I didn't appreciate the little socialist ending to your book. And so I called in a blue ribbon commission to look at the meatpacking industry, and they studied it for a year. You know what they found? It was worse. If anything, the jungle understates how bad it was. I mean, people's arms would be cut off in the gears of these machines and they would wind up in sausage. There were rats and mice and bats and, and excrement. And you, anything that could go into a vat wound up there. There were no standards. There was no inspection. It was disgusting. 
But keep in mind, this is not just like making ladies hats here. This is our food supply. Back at Jefferson's time, people grew their own food. But in my time, in an urban culture, people were dependent upon canned meat. And so this was a vital concern of the government of the United States. So this is my answer to the, the, the industrial conservatives who hate government. I called in the great meatpacking moguls to a White House conference, and I said, gentlemen, I have this report. I have not made it public. I'm asking you to take it home with you and study it and tell me what you intend to do. And of course, the great Armour and Swift and all the meat packers said, well, I'm sure this is exaggerated, Mr. President, but if there are any problems in the industry, let us reform the industry ourselves. Have you heard this? <laughs> oh, we'll take care of it, Mr. President. They said, I said, fine, I'll give you six months. And so off they went with all of their industrial arrogance. Six months later, they came back and they had a little tiny reform pamphlet they were going to change a thing here and fix a thing there. It was pathetic, inadequate. It was an appalling injustice to the American people. I said, is this your best offer of how you will reform your industry from within? And they said, you know what I'm about to say. They said, that's as much as we could do. If we did any more, it would bankrupt the industry. Have you heard that before? <laughs> we couldn't do more or we'd have to go out of business. They always say that and it's never true. I said, I'm giving you one last chance. They said, that's it. I said, gentlemen, you leave me no choice. I'm going to publish the report. And I published it. And when you, the consumer, discovered the truth about your meat, you demanded reform, and we passed the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act. But it would never, ever have occurred if industry had been called upon to do it itself. Here's the point. In a time of industrial gigantism and trusts and, and integrated corporations and these great capitalists like Morgan and Carnegie and Rockefeller, there's no entity that can stand up to them. The founding fathers didn't anticipate this. There were no corporations in Madison's time. And so now that we have this, we want it, we like wealth, we like industrialization. But there is one and only one entity big enough to stand up to these corporate giants. And guess what that is? It's government. If there were no government, there wouldn't be a redwood left on the planet. I won't go into great detail. You are mostly accurate about it. The, these were Negro soldiers who were stationed at Fort Brown down on the Mexican border. The, the, the white citizens of Brownsville hated these Negroes and were, resented that they were stationed there and did everything they could to make their lives impossible. But finally, apparently, the Negroes were driven into some sort of a riot and one person was killed and several were wounded and some property damage occurred. And when that happened, of course, I was called in to, to do an investigation. And I sent teams of investigators down. And they couldn't really resolve it. But here's what upset me. These black soldiers, who were mostly probably innocent, steadfastly refused to cooperate with the investigation. 
They would not testify. They would not cooperate. They would not engage in an honest investigation of a crime. And because they refuse to cooperate, and after all, they are military men, and I am their commander-in-chief, I saw no alternative but dishonorable discharge to 167 of them. Now, they have been later exonerated. I probably went too far with this. But I couldn't stand the military insubordination. I would have done it to Indian troops or white troops or Chinese troops. I just couldn't stand the way they created solidarity and refused to cooperate. So, in an act of some rashness, let me say, I discharged all of them, and some of them were national war heroes. Some of them had received the Medal of Honor, but I would not accept that sort of deliberate refusal to cooperate in an army investigation. Let's do two more. Here. Mr. President, I uh, had a very good relationship with uh, John Muir, and, uh, and he was a person who was quite different from you. He was a preservationist rather than a conservationist. He would spend time in the woods, he would spend time uh, in the city. Uh, but because of the cooperation between you and Mr. Muir, we were able to put together uh, the National Parks Program. <laughs> Now, the question is about Mueller, isn't it? You have garbled a couple of facts, but let me, let me just go to the point. In 1903, I made a 14,000-mile railroad journey across the American West. I wanted to see some things that I had never seen. I went for 14 days in Yellowstone with the great naturalist John Burroughs. I had been to Yellowstone before, but never in quite this way. And then I saw the Grand Canyon for the first time. I said, leave it alone. Nature has been a they work on it, and man can only mar it. I saw California for the first time. I saw Redwoods for the first time. And then I camped in Yosemite with John Muir for three days. No handlers, no secret service, no secretaries, just Muir and me. We have an extraordinary time. Now, he did offend me just a little at the beginning. <laughs> when he said to me, and I quote Mr. Roosevelt, when will you get over your boyish need to kill things? <laughs> that hurt my feelings a little. I took it, though, because I admired this viewer. And I later discovered, and I only say this to you, please don't repeat it, he doesn't know his birds. <laughs> he knows a tree, but he couldn't identify a lock. That's bad. So he kept. And we were all alone. And it was the most extraordinary. No tents. He would cut down boughs, and we would use them as a sort of outdoor <coughs> mattress. And on the third morning of this extraordinary time, we literally woke up covered with snow. No tent, but it snowed in the night. I woke up. Have you ever awakened covered with snow? It's quite an extraordinary experience. <laughs> So I shook the snow off, and I looked over at Muir, and he was looking over at me, and I suppose he thought that I might be a little urban. You know what I said? This is the greatest moment of my life! <laughs> and it was. I like this Muir, but he's a preservationist. A preservationist is somebody who wants to lock up the West. I am against that. We will lock up those things of extraordinary magnificence. Yosemite and, and Yellowstone and Glacier and Crater Lake and Mesa Verde and so on. We will, we will lock up those things that are unique in the world. But we will not lock up beautiful things, pretty good things. Man is on the earth to use the resources of the earth. And so my policy is not preservation, but conservation, wise use for sustained yield over generations. A little of the West will lock up forever. Most of the West, government control so that we use it in a sustainable pattern, especially forests. And then, of course, routine lands in Iowa, go ahead and farm those. <laughs> Let's do one last question here. Who has the last question tonight? Have I? Yes, right back there. Yeah, Mr. President. I invite you to stay after. I don't like your tone. Wish that I like more hunting on the Little Missouri or hunting Taft. Taft was a weak president. 
You know, I don't want to call attention to myself here, but let me say this one. <laughs> the Republican Party in my time consisted of two, two sides, as it does in your time. There were the, the Wall Street capitalists and moguls who just believed, leave us alone, we'll do what's right for the country, no regulation is best. You know those sorts of people. But then there were also the reformists, the progressives, the, the people who wanted to, to move the country a little bit towards a square deal for everybody. So on the one hand, you have the progressive wing of the party, and on the other hand, you have this sort of titans of industry wing of the party, and they don't get along very much. Because of the forcefulness of my personality, and the sheer willpower that I brought to it, and the joy of it, the joy matters most, I was able to yoke those two parts of the party together and make them an instrument for change. But Taft didn't have that capacity to do it. He had, eventually he had to choose. And he chose the capitalists. And he betrayed the progressive movement. He fired Pinchot. He betrayed our progressive activities. And I found that unforgivable. You know, I'll just say this much about Taft. And I don't mean any disrespect, but he was fat. <laughs> now, I'm a man of some girth, but I'm fit. And a fat man is a lazy man. And I'll tell you, he had, when he was running for the presidency, he asked me for my advice. And he said, Mr. Rosa, what's the best advice you can give me? Do you know what I said? Never be photographed golfing. I said, not only is golfing a sissy sport, but average Americans out in the heartland don't golf. They're too busy working, putting food on the table, taking care of their livestock, planting their gardens. They're tired at the end of the day. They don't want to go out and swat a ball around. I said, never be photographed golfing, because if you want, this is an important point in leadership, if you want to lead this country, you must narrow the gap between yourself and the average citizens of America. But if you hold that distance as a sign of pride, or even distance yourself from common people. You will lose their regard, and you deserve to lose their vote. And so I said, you must behave like an average citizen in this country. If you have to golf, do it, but don't be photographed. <laughs> and of course, he was photographed golfing, and that's just, it sums up his whole character. <laughs> so I don't, I don't accept what you say about Taft. If he had been a better president, he would have had two terms, of course. So, I think we should stop. I, I, no, I think, well, I think that you give us your last remarks as President Roosevelt, and then we get to meet a person who has lent some energy to you tonight. Well, let me, let me turn the subject entirely. Uh, there's so many more things. On you. Should we just take a break and come back? Yeah, that's, that's what okay. I mean. <laughs> so, take five minutes, and then we'll do another couple of hours. <laughs> well, let me just talk a little bit about Alice. I, I know some of you are thinking about my daughter. You've heard of Alice, haven't you? Well, she was the child of my first marriage. She was a very, very difficult child. She had a rebellious streak. She somehow, and I don't know if you can imagine this, but she somehow discovered where a few of my weaknesses are, and she was able to push that button. Does any of you have a child of this sort? <laughs> she drank liquor, which I think is a mistake. She smoked cigarettes. One day in the White House, I said, no child of mine will ever smoke in this house. You know what she did? She climbed up on the roof and smoked that. <laughs> She drove a jalopy at a time when that was very unusual, often at speeds of 25 miles per hour, and without a proper male escort. She formed that race suicide club. <coughs> she flirted with all of the eligible men of the District of Columbia, and some, may I say, strictly speaking, who were not eligible. <laughs> and if I might speak with complete candor, I suspect that she was engaged in what might be called heavy petting. <laughs> we 
had a house at Sagamore out on Long Island, and during one of the congressional recesses, I was out there, it was 3 a.m. And one of her many, 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 many suitors came out to see her in a jalopy. And unfortunately, he crashed that jalopy into the porch. Well, this was an age of assassination, so the Secret Service took this somewhat seriously. They found him slumped over the wheel of his jalopy, drunk, and they discovered that he was carrying a pistol. Serious business. By now, I had awakened. I came down in my dressing gown and said, By Godfrey, what's the ruckus here? <laughs> and my favorite Secret Service man took me aside. He said, Mr. Roosevelt, this gentleman is apparently a suitor of Alice. He's come out here in his jalopy. He's crashed into the porch. He's unharmed, but he's drunk, and I may say he's carrying a pistol. He said, may I speak freely, Mr. President? And I said, of course. He said, it's my opinion, sir, that this gentleman may be insane. <laughs> you know what I said? I said, of course, he's insane. He wishes to marry Alice. <laughs> Alice eventually married Nicholas Longworth of Ohio and Edith Poor. Long-suffering Edith, who had put up with this child so, so much and so often, we we threw her the finest wedding that had ever occurred in the White House, and she complained about every piece of it. The invitations weren't engraved well enough. There wasn't high enough quality champagne. Her dress was not what she had expected. We didn't have a number of guests that she needed, and so on and so forth. It was so dreary. But we gave her the best wedding ever. And at the end of it, Edith went up to her. And I watched this, and I tell you it is true. My lovely second wife, Edith, kissed Alice on the mouth for the first time. And said, and I quote, We're glad you're going. You've been nothing but trouble. <laughs> what Owen Wister said to me, the great author of The Virginian, one of my closest friends. He was in my tennis cabinet. And after Alice had done something really, really awful, he came to me one day when I was president, and he said, Mr. President, can't you control Alice? And I said, look, I can run this country, or I can control Alice, but I cannot do both. <laughs> And so my urge to all of you is that from this night forward, you begin to regenerate your lives. You take yourself more seriously, you get some exercise, you write some letters and books and raise your children to be Republican Anglo-Saxon breeders. <laughs> takes over, and you saw, you've seen it for two days now. He is the most energetic person that I've ever encountered in the whole course of my life. I, I don't even begin to understand him, because I don't know if you could tell, but I'm just exhausted and sweating profusely, and this is 90 minutes. He did this for 60 years. <laughs> talk, 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 read. Shoot something. Climb something. On his honeymoon, he climbed the Matterhorn. He left his bride back in the hotel. And he was one of the first Americans ever to climb the Matterhorn. My favorite, but my favorite story. And I'm going to ask Patricia Limer a question so that she can at least get four sentences. <laughs> and I'm so sorry, Patty. No, no but you see what happens. Think about it. No. But Roosevelt came here in 1905. You probably know this. That he wanted to kill a mountain lion, and so he rode ahead and he got a. Uh, a guide and hounds and so on. Then a bunch of people out under near Eagle were going after this mountain lion. 
they had a hard time with it, and eventually they heard the dogs yelping, and the dogs said, treat a mountain lion. And I don't know if you've ever seen a cougar, but this is, a, you can see one in this building, but this is a mighty creature. And so they had, the dogs had treed this mountain lion, and one of the dogs actually sort of shinnied up the tree. And the mountain lion was swatted it and killed it, and then all these horsemen came around with their rifles, and they were they had surrounded this tree, and up there is this terrified, angry, lethal mountain lion. And they waited for Roosevelt, and he got there, and they said, well, Mr. Roosevelt, you may now shoot your cougar. And Roosevelt said, I'm not going to shoot that cougar, it's in a tree. And so, so eventually the, the mountain lion jumped out of the tree and it was surrounded by these hounds and the hounds were going in. You can picture this and the mountain lion was swatting them and maiming them and so on. So finally they said, look, just shoot it. I mean, they're going to kill all the dogs. And so Roosevelt, and this is not, this is a true story. Roosevelt put his rifle in the hands of somebody else and took out a knife and he went into the circle and he killed the mountain lion with a knife. I just want you to think of George Bush doing this. <laughs> This is a madman who goes in. Would you do this? And he goes in and faces this hot lion and dispatches it with his knife. And this is the story that I like to tell when I when I talked about Panama. Is, you know, he later said that he wished that he had had a ghastly wound. This is a strange man who had a hectic urge for activity. And he seems to have had to prove himself. Part of it was because his father had opted out of the Civil War. Part of it because he was an invalid as a child, but if ever there was a man who had to prove that he was a man, it was Roosevelt. But on the other hand, he had one of the greatest lives in history. He just he just got to live this way. And when I get to portray him, I just think, where is he now? You know, where is he now? I once wrote an essay about this saying, uh, and I, don't, I mean no disrespect, but I said, Bush with the brain, Clinton with character. You know, that's what Roosevelt was. He had both. He had action and contemplation. He was, he was an extraordinarily intelligent man. He was the best read president in American history, the writingest president in American history. He went to Germany in 1910 on that, on that post-safari trip. He lectured at German universities to German professors of German literature in German. No, when John Kennedy went to Berlin and, and, and choked out Ich bin ein Berliner, we regarded him as a Renaissance man. <laughs> Roosevelt lectured in German at German universities to German professors in German. When's the last time we saw anything like this, Patty? Oh, I knew. He said he was going to ask me There's a question, and I've been sitting here in terror. How do you... How do you flying terror. Here's your chance. How do you place Roosevelt? How do I place Roosevelt? How do you place Roosevelt? We will have a reception here in a moment. Well, I guess we might, but... Uh, hey, what do you make of all this guy? You know, Clay, I'm sorry to say that I'm better set up to say what I think about you right now than what I think about <laughs> Roosevelt. And I guess I will start by, by saying that, that I just, I, I, I don't know that I take my friends for granted. If I do, I will make every effort to fight that. But I've known Clay for ages, and I am just thunderstruck by his, his gifts and his talents and his capacity to put all this stuff in his mind and have it there at the moment and to, to be to lend his life and spirit to this dead and departed person and so many others and so I am just I, I think Roosevelt is very impressive I'm not, I'll get back to that maybe in a moment but I would just like to say I have been just swept away by this and if you can stay no 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 Reception. I would just say, say this much, yes. uh, that I so appreciate what Clay said about the difference between this man and many of our current public figures, and I don't know what to do about that. I don't know. Can you imagine what the press would do to this man? At the, the Theodore Roosevelt, not Clay Jenkins, we can't even imagine that, but, but what, what, you know, what happened to Theodore Roosevelt. And so I think it is one of those look in the mirror at ourselves at what we would require when, we, when someone declares he or she would like to run for public office. The, it's, out of the, it's out of the jungle what we put them through. We put them through the meat grinders. We do this whole process of reducing them. So I guess I ask us when we look in the mirror, as Mr. Roosevelt asked us to do, 
we should be asking ourselves why we would want to put public figures through a meat grinder. How could that be served? And, and ask ourselves if we could, in fact, tolerate, engage in, celebrate, recognize that taking a, a public figure of talent who has flubbed or misspoken or has an attitude be like taking that person and carrying him to the trash heap or carrying her to the trash heap, that really should end. Here, here. And recognizing well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Which isn't to say that we want sinful public figures. I didn't say that, but I just think <laughs> we, are, we are going to have heroes who have feet of clay, thank the Lord, because otherwise they are heroes we cannot emulate and aspire to match. So the more flawed our heroes in some ways, the better they are to imitate. And, and thank you, Clay, and thank Bye. you. Bye, Gosford. We'll see you in the lobby. Yes, thank right. You. Okay. <laughs>